Good afternoon, Dr. Keller. My name is Mason McHugh. I attend seventh grade in St. Mary's Catholic School in Temple, Texas. Thank you for this opportunity for me to interview you during the month of the military child. Well, thank you, Mason. It's very nice to meet you. Nice to meet you, too. It's an honor to meet you. Hmm. So, it, what a great opportunity to talk to a military child during the month of the military child. So, mm -hmm. thank, you, thank you for the honor of this opportunity to talk. Mm -hmm. Let's get started. Okay. All right. Well, why did you see a need for the Military Child Education Coalition? So, you know, it was kind of one of those things that it isn't like one day you just woke up and you decided that there was this need. You know, it was more like something that came together over time. So let me take you back to 1996, long before you were born. Um, I was a school administrator for the Colleen Independent School District that serves uh, many students who are connected to Fort Hood, you know, like your own father. And, you know, what we, what we learned was when kids moved and changed schools a lot, especially when they got to high school, that, you know, there was big challenges with courses and credits or if they wanted to play sports. It was just the whole thing that you've experienced of moving and changing schools. You didn't have to fit back in again and, you know, find your way. So it wasn't just me, but it was a group of folks that, uh, you know, really thought about, uh, you know, what we've learned here in our own school district. Is that also what we learned in other school districts? Uh, so what we did was ask some other folks from other school districts that serve military kids, including the Department of Defense schools. And it started really with a community conversation uh, from those who serve uh, military students in the K-12 setting. And what we found out is everybody had the same worries. So what do we do about it? And that's when the group came together and said, you know, what we need is a permanent effort. You know, so let's don't just sit around talking about it. Let's do something for about 2 million kids whose parents serve in the active duty forces, the National Guard and the Reserve. So that happened. This conversation happened in 97. We confirmed that we wanted to have an organization. And in 1998, uh, we were incorporated officially uh, as a nonprofit organization, the Military Child Education Coalition. And that doesn't mean anything if you don't do something about it. So it was immediately into how do we put things into action. And that is the need always had to be child-centered. So the name, Military Child Education Coalition, and it's not Military Children Education Coalition because the focus on the individual child for the sake of the child uh, was a core value for us from the very beginning. So you can say two million kids whose parents are serving, and it's almost like it doesn't mean anything. But if you say Mason, you know, we want to focus on Mason and what it's like, you know, uh, for you, you know, as you move from place to place and for your parents. That's, that was it. That was a driving force. So yes, it was about a lot of kids, but it was really about one, one student. And then I think the other driving force was how do we serve our country uh, by serving the kids? Uh, who also serve, you know, with an all-volunteer military that's married with children, most married with children, you know, uh, what can we do, uh, you know, to say, hey, the kids count and the kids matter and we need to do something and to incorporate their ideas into how we, how we serve. So let me ask you a question. How many times have you moved? I have moved seven times so far. Wow. So the average number of moves is, you know, six to nine moves from kindergarten to graduation. So you're right there. You're right there in the, in the heat of it. And that's, uh, you know, exactly the kinds of experiences that kids have, especially those whose parents serve in the active duty forces. Uh, what improvements do you recognize after MSEC was developed? So we've been around now uh, next year in terms of when the community conversation happened in 97. Uh, next year starts our 20th year. And you know, when we started, Mason, we weren't really thinking about uh, the National Guard and Reserve. We weren't. We were so focused on the academic moves, and those tended to be for kids whose parents were in the full-time military, the active forces for the Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, and Coast Guard. 
uh, and then uh, we did a study for the Army, the Secondary Education Transition Study. And you know, an outgrowth of that uh, was deep understanding of how important it was to pay attention to the first two weeks of when a student transitions in. So you may have had the experience yourself. Have you ever moved in during the middle of the year after school started, or was it all in the summer? It was all in the summer. Yeah. Well, you know, if you move in the summer, the plus is better academically. But the hard thing is hooking up with friends. And, you know, you may have experienced that sports or band or whatever it is that you're interested in. Um, but the first two weeks of fitting in, uh, we call them the fragile first two weeks. And we really discovered that by working with 54 high schools in a study we did for the Army. And then an outgrowth of that was um, the student-to-student -student program. So I would say things to be proud of. I'm very proud that from the very beginning we were focused on children, an individual child, that we, we started from a re being research-informed then to action. And that meant our student-to-student -student programs, our professional development, and our parent training. So in... in 2001, we had some things in place so that when, you know, September 11th happened and then 2002, you know, when we really geared up for this long, long time that we've been at war, uh, we were also able to flex and to pay attention to something we should have paid attention to from the beginning, and that was to the children whose parents were in the National Guard Reserve. And we had to learn quickly about deployment, separation, and what does that mean? What does it mean for kids in school? And how can we better support families? So I guess another thing I could say I'm really, really proud of is we have a great team of people that work here. But you know what? We have a lot of volunteers, and that includes thousands of students that are in their schools every day making a difference from little kindergartners all the way up to have college-age students that are helping and kids at the academies that are reaching out and helping us be strong. And it really is a community of care. So not one person, but rather a team uh, that surrounds kids with a convoy of support. How does MSEC contribute to the resiliency of military and veteran-connected children? So if I had to ask you what resiliency meant for you, I mean, what, what does that mean to you? I mean, you're, you're, you're a seventh grader. You're doing some really important work. You're about to start into high school. I mean, what, what does that mean to you? Uh, for me, resilience means, like, the ability to adapt to other, like, cultures or climates and stuff like that. I mean, that's really brilliant. You could be one of our trainers right now because that really is what resiliency is. It's It's... It's that springing back, you know, and sometimes, you know, you've got the tools and supports to be resilient, and sometimes you have to reach out to other people. And I would think that that really is what we try to do as a Military Child Education Coalition, is we know we cannot be all things to all people. Nobody can be. But what we can do is, is say, what are really good resources that people can rely on? How do we provide the best of training? But really, how do we listen to other people and to their experiences? And even more than resilience is thriving. So resilience is overcoming something, adapting. And the thriving is really striving for a life hardiness. Uh, uh, you know, of, of saying, if, if I can't figure this out, I'm, I'm strong enough to know when I need to reach out to other people. And, and that's okay. I mean, that's, that's part of being hardy, is you, you don't have to know everything. So I, I bet you've already figured it out. I mean, sometimes do you have study groups at St. Mary's that, you know, maybe maybe you lead or somebody else leads? Hmm. Yeah. Uh, uh, yes, ma'am. Yeah. So. You don't have to or you ask your teacher or, or, you know, you say, hey, I don't have to know all this, but just knowing who else I can call on, it, you know, also makes me resilient. What impact does MSEC make on the local, state, and national levels? So that's really a public policy question. And a public policy starts in local schools. Uh, for example, you know, a student is new when they come into the school. Uh, you know, that's, that school may flex around, 
you know, helping that student get into the programs that they need. Uh, if that student has special needs, you know, really helping adapt, you know, what what they have provided to what the student was used to and how do you make that transition smooth. At the school district level, it can mean, uh, are we sensitive? Uh, do we know what the interstate compact says if a student comes in and they've already met a standard in one state, you know, does that mean that, that we can make it smoother when they transition here? Uh, for example, if they've already passed a test to be a senior in one state, you know, they don't have to take it over again in our state. But it can mean, let's think about what our policies are, for example, being valedictorian and salutatorian. You know, if you have a policy that says you have to be here two or three years before your senior year, is that inclusive? So I think, you know, what we've done is through our professional development is, is really help folks, you know, think about their own local policies. And is it accommodating for a military child that moves in, but really any child? At the state level, we've done some things in terms of public policy, uh, for example, in several states that, you know, pre-kindergarten students are eligible for state uh, pre-kindergarten programs. Uh, or, you know, if you graduate from high school in this state and you apply to college, can you get in state tuition? So it's not just us, but other folks working hard on that. And then we've just recently been able to get the military student identifier adopted in 19 states, and now President Obama signed the Every Student Succeeds Act after seven years of working that we're so proud that in America's national education policy, uh, military uh, children are recognized. That means when a parent enrolls their child that they have an option uh, to check a block to let that school know that, you know, this is a military family. And you'd be surprised how many schools don't even realize that they have military-connected kids in school. What current needs or what future needs do you see military children having? You know, you know, I, I'm really interested in technology. I'm interested in the things that are that that you're experiencing now and that you're going to experience in in college. I mean, things are changing very fast in the education world, and you know how uh, courses are delivered, how instructional experiences are. Are, are provided to students. Like we've been really talking to our friends at Google, for example. They have this thing called Google Cardboards where students can take a virtual a field trip, but it's a 3D simulation. Wow. I mean, things are just moving really fast that give, you know, uh, you and other students a lot of experiences that, you know, that they haven't had before. That's interesting, but what does that mean in terms of transitions, in terms of opportunity? So if you move from place to place, one place may have a lot of support and resources and tools, and then maybe another place doesn't. So how do we help smooth that out? That's a challenge. Uh, or if you start a career and technology program that maybe is a two-year program that you're doing with a community college and you move, and then what does that mean? If can you can you keep up with it? And so that's really interesting. I, I think the other challenge is there's more and more choices for parents. I mean, it, it you know your family has chosen parochial schools, but there's private schools, there's home school, there's charter schools, and there's public. And over eighty percent of our kids are in public school at any given time, but they also may flow through, you know, the other school choices like you did when you move from a parochial school to a public school at Leavenworth. So you had that experience yourself. So that can be a wonderful enrichment, but it can make transitions uh, a little harder, and that's why uh, parent education is so important. And I think letting parents know that you have to be a good consumer. You know, what's that school rating? Is that school accredited? You know, that sort of thing. Um, so I'm really interested in it. At the same time, we have this vastly changing environment that give people a lot of different opportunities, but at the same time, that kind of adds to the complexity. Does that make sense? Yes. Yep. And that's all the questions I have for you. Well, I have questions for you. So if, if you had to give me advice uh, for the Military Child Education Coalition, I mean, what do you wish that we would do? I mean, you're as important, you're more important 
than any adults, uh, you know, th thoughts about what we could do. If we say we're the, for the sake of the child, I mean, what does that mean uh, for you? What should we do? Well, that's a hard question because it seems you're already doing everything I'd already ask you to do. Now, how would you know that we were doing everything that, I mean, what, what sense do you get that we're, we're doing the right things? When I tell you our story, what makes sense for you in, in terms of saying, yeah, that feels right, you know? Uh, it's because you're, like you said, you're not focusing on the children, you're focusing on the child. So you're, instead of focusing on a group of children, you're focusing on just the one child and what that one child needs and wants. Yeah. And you know what? We have to remind ourselves that all the time. Mm -hmm. And I, I so appreciate you saying that. I mean, that has to be our core value. You know, that for the sake of the child, we have to live it. And then when we think of a good idea or here's a cool thing we could do, you know, we have to stop and ask ourselves, you know, how do kids benefit? How does a child benefit? And, uh, you know, it really isn't two million kids whose parents are serving or two million kids whose parents are post 9-11 veterans. Because in a family, as you know, in your family, it's, it's just, you know, what does it do for my child or what does it do for me? So what are your plans for the future? I mean, what do you kind of know what you're sort of feeling like you may want to do? And I know it's not fair to, to know everything in seventh grade, so, hmm. you know. I'm not quite sure what I'm going to do in life. Hmm. I'm thinking about joining the Army, actually. Do you know that uh, over 50% of those who join the military come from a military family? Hmm. So, um, you know, you already see that your dad and your mom's service uh, to our nation uh, has made a difference for your family. So tell me, you know, they talk about the military core values of respect for persons and, you know, why patriotism matters. Tell me what it is about your parents' service that's made you think that you might be interested in joining the Army. Uh, it's because they... They're always so determined to get stuff done right and get it done efficiently. Mm -hmm. Mm. So that, that whole determination, that grit, and that perseverance, uh, what we also know, even if you don't join the Army, that that's associated with people in their lives that are successful. So if you decide to join the Army or you decide to do anything else, just that you've recognized those values as being essential is very mature. I mean, uh, Mason, that's going to pay off for you in the long run. Thank you. So is there anything else you want to ask me? Um, no, I believe that's all. Okay, well, thank you. And it's, it is our honor to serve you and to serve all of the kids uh, whose parents uh, serve our nation and those whose parents have served our nation. So thank, thank you for this chance.